Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Mary Magdalene is interviewed by Eloisa Lytton Hitchens on the topic of Mary identity. The interview was held on the 2nd of September 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is session one, part one. Hi, I'm Mary Magdalene, and in this series on our Frequently Asked Questions channel, I'm going to be answering questions that are commonly asked to me by members of the public and of the media. And I've asked my good friend Eloisa to come and compile the questions and ask them of me in this next series that you're about to view. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Are you claiming to be Mary Magdalene? Yes, I am Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and I am saying that publicly and I have been for a number of years. Um, I was born in 1979 here in Australia and my parents named me Mary Luck, which is why there's often a little bit of confusion <laughs> about what to call me. Um, but I've been Mary Magdalene for a lot longer than I've been known as Mary Luck. I had a life in the first century and I was the wife of Jesus and I learned and taught divine truth with him and then after his passing and I passed into the spirit world and I had a life there. Mm. Um, and just since 1979, or I was conceived in 1978, have I been back here on earth. So I'm not claiming that I've had many lives before, uh, this, as, that I've been Mary Magdalene and then had many other lives, just that I, I've had one continuous life on earth, then in the spirit world, and now back here on earth again. I'm also not claiming to be the essence of Mary Magdalene <laughs> that many women can embody. Yeah. I'm saying that there's one of me and um, that's me. Uh, and elements of what is uh, recorded in the Bible and is known about me in folklore, there's parts of that that are true, but largely the story of my life that has happened is pretty much unknown on earth. So I'm not claiming that everything that's in the Bible is correct or that how I'm depicted in the Bible is necessarily correct, although parts of it are. And I'm not saying that uh, the story attached to my name in certain sets of folklore is real. I'm just saying that I'm Mary Magdalene, <laughs> who is somewhat known historically, but largely unknown. Yep. Is that cool? When did you first consider that you are Mary Magdalene? To answer this question, I reckon we need to talk a bit about my views on spirituality before I met AJ. Yeah. Because prior to that, I'd always had a real interest in growth. I would have called it personal growth. And my dad was quite interested in sort of new age philosophies and spirituality for most of my life. And I kind of shared that interest with him. So we used to talk about things and I'd been to different workshops and a few meditation groups and things like that. And it was always this real, um, it was quite a personal, private kind of a fascination, I suppose, that I had uh, for a long time that I now recognise as a longing for God that got quite confused and suppressed because of my parents' emotions towards religion and towards God, which are quite disillusioned. Right. And so growing up as a child, I didn't really have a strong sense that longing for God was a really accepted thing, I suppose, mm -hmm. from, a, from an emotional perspective. So I always harboured this interest in spirituality, but I had a very, I, I like to think that I had a pragmatic view of it, in that I didn't really tolerate um, stuff that was what I would probably call a bit namby-pamby, like <laughs> stuff that didn't really seem to have relevance to day-to-day -day life. Yeah. My question was always, how is this practice or how is this philosophy actually going to make me a better person or the world a better place? That was always my kind of litmus test for anything. Mm -hmm. And I often found a lot of things lacking in terms of my own personal experience of them. I didn't find that they were making me more loving and so I didn't really investigate much further. So that's a bit of background about my spiritual beliefs. 
And I also want to talk a bit about re my ideas about reincarnation because cool. that's sort of relevant to whether or not I've considered being anyone else. Um, so obviously through this, uh, you know, all my life, really 20 years of kind of talking to my dad about spirituality and meeting other people who were quite interested in spirituality in a new age sense pretty much, yeah. um, I'd been exposed to lots of ideas about reincarnation. And a lot, I knew people who believed that they were reincarnated quite strongly. And I had been told that I'd had past lives. And not much of it really gelled with me because of my first uh, test that I had on everything, which was, well, how does mm. even believing in this stuff help us? There seems to be so much mystery surrounding it. And I could also feel that often people had a desire to make themselves like more special or important or to give themselves a sense of meaning that was lacking in other areas mm -hmm. by believing that they had had a past life. So essentially I didn't really believe in it because it didn't really, <laughs> which is sort of ironic if you yep. think about it. <laughs> um, and we should be clear in this answer as well that I'm not I'm not saying, just because I'm saying I'm Mary Magdalene, I'm not yeah. saying that I'm reincarnated in the sense that a lot of people understand yeah. it to be on the planet now. So yeah. I'm not saying that I'm a soul that's had a series of past lives. I'm saying I've had one life and this is just my second time back on Earth and it's quite extraordinary and not very common yep. thing that happens on Earth. So anyway, that, that was my background with spirituality and my ideas about reincarnation. I didn't really give it much like attention because I thought well how's it I didn't even really I didn't really believe in it but I didn't also spend much time thinking or talking about it because I thought well how's it relevant to my life now mm -hmm. is it going to make me a more loving person if it's not then I don't really want to spend time on it so I'd never I'd never really seriously considered that I was anyone other than Mary Luck even though as we just <laughs> talked about in the other question there was all these soul things going on all the time I didn't really have a framework for understanding that and mm -hmm. I certainly didn't consider it was because uh, I was reincarnated in some way. So then if we fast forward or yep. rewind or <laughs> to <laughs> when I met AJ. So I first met AJ about six years ago now, a little bit under six years. Um, and I'd just been living overseas for five years doing different things. I was a volunteer in a refugee camp and I was working in Scotland and I was basically out exploring life and what I wanted my life to be about really. Yeah. Uh, and I'd been in a relationship with someone and that had ended and because of that and some visa issues that I was having in the country I was in, I, I landed back home at my parents' house. Sort of, not really, I was in a bit of a state of flux in that I was thinking, what's the next step? Hmm. I was already engaged in studying a master's degree by correspondence. I was pretty sure that's where I was headed and that it was just a question of which country I was going to go to next and work in, basically. So, the perfect plan. Yeah, I had it all sorted out. <laughs> uh, then what? <laughs> yeah, then what? Uh, so, um, I think it was like New Year's Eve or just before, my parents had this guy who they'd been having come visit them in their home for about a year or so before this, uh, giving free talks to people about spirituality. And they said, oh, you know, I'd be interested for you to come so you can see what we've been into. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, I'll come. And I wasn't really that engaged with even a desire to explore spirituality at that time because I was like feeling I want to focus on my career yep. and, and I was also dealing with this end of this relationship and so I wasn't really looking for romance in any, <laughs> in any way. Uh, so I, I found myself at a couple of talks that AJ gave in my parents' home over the next couple of weeks and I was quite interested in what he had to say but I didn't really think that he needed to be telling people that he was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt quite drawn to him, but not really in a romantic way. I certainly didn't consider that I was his soulmate. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't. Didn't even occur to me. I didn't even analyse my response to him very much. I just thought I'd like to talk to that guy more. And on one or two occasions, I did try to talk to him more, and he was sort of very quiet and <laughs> I later found out it was because he was 
a bit nervous to talk to me. But I was like, what's with this guy? You know, he talks all the time to other people and I talk to him and he just sort of clams up. You didn't make any correlation. I oh, know, nothing. I had no consciousness that really, that he, well, that he really had an interest in me, really. But this is how little my self-analysis was going on at this right. point in yep. my life because yep. the story unfolds. Yep. So um, a few weeks, I, he was leaving to go on an overseas trip. And so before he left, he did the first Secrets of the Universe a video that it's probably the first video that you saw, I'm not sure, but... No, parenting. Parenting. <laughs> <laughs> lots of people, for lots of people, it's the first one that they saw. The yeah, old one. Yeah. And I felt really strongly I wanted to go to that talk. Yeah. But because of certain series of events, my dad was really kind of weird about it. And he was like, oh, well, I'll come with you. And I, I was sort of thinking, oh, I wouldn't mind going on my own. And, and anyway, uh, then I was going to go with someone else. And in the end, it didn't end up me going. So I didn't go. And a couple of weeks later, I sort of sat down and I was talking to my parents about what I thought my next step would be in terms of my career and all of those sorts of things. And they said, well, look, while we're talking, um, we probably should tell you something that just because we know it and we feel strange that we know and you don't know. And I said, oh, OK. I had no idea what they were going to say to me, or so I thought. Um, and they said to me, well, we just wanted to let you know that, you know that AJ Miller guy? Well, you know he actually thinks that you're his soulmate. Wow. Which, and then I had a really weird reaction, Eloisa. Yeah, what do you do? <laughs> I just, the first words out of my mouth were, I knew it. And then I just sat there stunned because I thought, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying? That's weird. Like, and I sat and I kind of looked at my parents dumbfounded and they looked at me. <laughs> Were they a real dumbfounded too? Because well, your reaction. Yeah, yeah. They, wow. And then I immediately backtracked and went, oh, that's weird. No, no. He probably thinks that about a lot of women. and, and you know, Minimise the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> and Dad went, uh, no, I don't think so. Wow. And I said, oh. so, and then I, I, I was just sort of dumbfounded because I just had this response that I didn't understand. <laughs> and so I just sort of sat there. <laughs> my parents sat there and they said, huh? right then, well, if you'd ever like to talk about it, um, you know, where we are and just sort of moved on with the day. Probably had a cup of tea. <laughs> I don't know. And you were just like, there's news. Like, this yeah. would be like some pretty big news, I reckon. Well, it was a very strange thing because obviously I had that reaction. Yeah. And then I thought, ah, oh. but you know, I just immediately tried to minimise it. And then I thought, why do I even care? You know, who is this guy again? Like, what's going on? And so just this whole thing started up in this conflict between my brain and my soul commenced immediately where I just thought, this is weird. And this guy's, I didn't... And then after that, I realised, this guy's saying that he's Jesus, you know. So uh, what does that make me? You yeah. know, so in answer to the question, which is, when did I first consider I was Mary Magdalene? Probably at some time in the day or so after that conversation with my parents. It, the penny dropped that that's who, that's who it would make me. Mm. And, and then that kicked off a whole other set of feelings. Mm. And actually, I got quite fearful and angry about it, you know, very soon after that because I thought, I don't really want that yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't really I don't really like that my soul is or my feelings are saying to me like there's something big here you need to pay attention here yeah. I, I don't like that because actually I'd prefer to just forget about this and move on and I tried very hard to do that over the next couple of months and um, that didn't really work out either yeah so, but in answer, we should stay, stick to the question, which yep. is when I first considered it. That's yep. when I first considered it. But I didn't feel that it was resolved at that point. I didn't feel that I'd made peace with it. I didn't really like it. Mm. And I didn't... I actually then kind of got it in my head that I needed to convince AJ that it wasn't <laughs> true. <laughs> 
that's a little bit further down the track when I, when I felt that I had to resolve it, actually. I considered it and then I felt that I needed to resolve it some months afterwards because mm. I couldn't deny all this stuff that was going on. So did you have, like, an inkling that it, it, it might, like, you know, that... Well, obviously, you had to consider it in the first place. But did you... Did you I know then you went, no, I'm going to convince him. But obviously, well, I don't know. I feel often when you want to convince things that you... Did you feel that there was some element of truth in it to make that decision or...? Definitely. Right. And you just wanted it so badly not to be true. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a huge conflict that started to happen inside of me. Like, literally, when my parents... I had no idea what they were going to say. They said it. And I said I knew it. And in that moment, I felt that it was true. Yeah. And that freaked me out. Yeah. Because I had no, like, I had no context for that. I had no desire for that, really. I had no even feeling that, oh, that AJ Miller guy, I'd really like to pursue him. There was none of yeah. that. Yeah. I was really caught up in a whole other series of things that were going on in my life. And I kind of felt like for the first time in my life, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And suddenly... My parents saying, well, this spiritual guy that we've been listening to, well, he thinks that you're soulmates. And I said I knew it and I felt it. Then I just went into complete backtrack from that point. Yeah. And it, it did, it triggered a lot of fear inside of me. I thought, if I'm going to, I couldn't even really think it through. If I kind of considered that it was true, yeah. like when, if I let myself feel the feeling that I felt it was true, it kicked off a whole other set of fears. Like, what does that mean? What's our life going to be like? Do I even like that man? <laughs> what, yeah. I don't feel like anyone special or different. How can that be true? But hang on, I do feel different. But I don't really, you know, want to feel different. Mm -hmm. And I really, really want to be accepted. I, and that's probably been the biggest challenge for me since I met AJ, is confronting this feeling that I have that I want society to accept me. Yeah. I really want to feel like I'm normal and I fit in. And even more, like if I'm even more honest, I wanted to feel like I was pretty hip and cool, really. I wanted to feel like I had the world sorted out and I was pretty worldly and knowledgeable. And, and all of, so all of that stuff started to get challenged as soon as I would consider that it's true. And so then I would go into this whole intellectual rationalisation about how it couldn't be true. And then I would find myself back at this feeling of like, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. And I would just be sitting at my parents' house. They live kind of out of town. They have a beautiful garden and I'd be sitting in the garden for hours. Just I couldn't talk to anyone about it. I couldn't... Because I couldn't even really articulate what I was feeling. I was just sitting there staring into space, <laughs> um, feeling like, oh, my God, this is true, but I don't, I don't understand how this can be true. And... And how didn't I know this? And if it is true, what does it really all mean? And oh, that can't be true. And, you know, all this kind of back and forth that really went on for years, yeah. it, which was really me, my fears, trying to suppress the, the, the knowledge that I already had. Yeah. You know, when you're talking, it feels like your soul on one hand's like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> she just realised. Yes. You know, and the other it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That, and that's, it was like... It was like my soul finally feeling relief. Yeah. But then it terrified me. And so I actually got quite distressed. Uh, it, it, uh, the more I kind of... It was sort of okay when I was alone. <laughs> but the more I tried to reconcile it with my life as it was then, with my yeah. friends, like how could I even talk to anyone about this? And with my career and with with my parents even, who were just freaked about the whole idea. Um, and with, just with everything, mm. uh, I would just go into this sort of uh, turmoil that, that eventually, the more I kind of avoided the, the release of that, the f feeling of the fears, became distressing. But yeah. that kind of happened over, over a year, I yeah. would say, yeah. yeah. There's another thing when you, you said um, you want to be hip and cool and worldly and I always find that like kind of ironic in itself because 
you're probably one of the most worldly people on the planet right now in the sense of like you've lived for all this time and have all this beautiful knowledge and all these things and yet you know that's still that societal yeah. pressure I suppose it, it is so you know yeah I mean the desire to want it is yeah. just so strong yeah and the world doesn't think I'm worldly the world thinks I'm a bit of a nutcase so yeah. it's really you're Challenging. right in saying that yeah, I probably do know a lot more about the world than a lot of people. Yeah. But um, the the real feeling I had was that the world views me as worldly. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> How do you know you are Mag Mary Magdalene? Good question. <laughs> it's a good question because a lot of the time, especially over the last five years, perhaps not as much now. Mm. Um, but over that time, I've often wandered around trying to convince myself that I don't know that I am, that, that it's still in question inside of me, that I have to sort it out and figure it out. But the truth is that I know that I am. And the reason that I've, ha that I've been in that state for such a long time of wanting to question it and wanting to doubt it, inside, what I already feel inside of myself, is because, largely because of how the world views that, me saying that and me living that. Obviously, a lot of people think that I'm, my sanity is in question, really, by saying that. Or they think that I'm in a cult and that I'm somehow being hypnotised or mind-controlled or something weird is going on with me where I'm not in control of myself or my will or my ideas. And that's a pretty yucky feeling to have others feel about you and to feel coming from other people. And I haven't wanted to really be myself fully because I've felt that that's a yucky thing to feel and I didn't want to experience that coming from others. It's also because there's a, like a large majority of, or a large number of people on the planet are Christians and they have a lot of ideas about who Jesus should be and who I am. And the fact that me saying that I'm Mary Magdalene and I'm the wife of Jesus and Jesus actually didn't die to save your sins and actually a lot of what you believe to be Christian truth is not actually true. Mm. That has always been pretty scary for me. I've felt like... I've felt like being open and honest and resolving and saying I've resolved this within myself would mean that people would attack us and vilify us and call us, you know, sacrilegious and all of these kinds of things. Mm. So there's another avoidance of me wanting to avoid the disapproval of other people. And also in, in New Age philosophies, there's a lot of people who believe that, you know, Mary Magdalene is the divine feminine and she's in everyone and, and many women believe they are Mary Magdalene and I've had a lot of fear of confronting those women emotionally. Not that I've ever gone and told yeah. them that they're wrong or sought out confrontation with them, but just me saying these things publicly does cause women to contact me and tell me that I'm not or that we all are or that I'm wrong. And um, Yeah, and I've, I have a lot of feelings still of feeling that I'm inadequate in some way, actually, that I should be better. <laughs> because of the projections of others? And probably a feeling inside of myself that I feel like I actually have been very much more connected to God and reflected a lot more of God's truth and God's love in my life before I came back to earth. And so there's a big feeling inside of me that oh, I'm not good enough, which is an error. It's totally not the truth from God's perspective, but because I do have that feeling, mm. then it makes me want to hide from others and not say who I am and not be just completely frank and honest and exposed. So that's a lot of background, I suppose, yeah. to this question, which is how I know. Yeah. Because for a long time, I've probably appeared as if I don't know. And I was very much invested in people having that opinion because it helped me avoid them having to confront all of their preconceptions about me or all of all of their feelings towards me being definite, I wanted to avoid. 
and that's also that's that's me living in fear, and that didn't have very good results. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got it anyway. Yeah, because I got it anyway. In some cases, I also got mm. other yucky projections, which mm. were, oh, that Mary, she's a bit wishy-washy, not really sure, and and so then people, I've received projections that. AJ is controlling me, which isn't the truth, or that I'm not very bright or <laughs> those kinds of things. So, you know, I was being shown that I wasn't really in a state of love about this, yeah. this situation. You know, I was, I was living in fear and avoiding just being really clear. So let's get on to how I know. Yep, awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the short answer is I know who I am because... I remember my life in the first century and in the spirit world. I remember who I am in that, in, because I remember events and relationships and things that happened. So in that way, I know. Mm. But I haven't always allowed that knowledge, I suppose, and we mentioned this briefly in the last question, because I have had a lot of I have actually suppressed a lot of my emotions and my emotional experience since I reincarnated back in 1979. I've actively tried to suppress some, well, a lot of my memories and emotions because they confronted fears within me, some of the fears that we just spoke about, yeah. but also the feeling of feeling confused about why I have memories that are not related to the life that I was involved in living. Um, so when I first met AJ, and we talked a little bit late, uh, earlier about um, how, how that happened in that I met him at my parents' home and eventually they said to me that uh, he felt that we were soulmates and I had this really strange reaction or a strange, as I felt it was strange then, of just saying I knew it <laughs> straight away <laughs> and um, that really shocked me in a lot of ways because I did feel that I knew it right then yeah. uh, and I did a lot of um, emotional or psychological reasoning to try to get myself back from that point but in a way I, in that moment I, I understood what I'd always kind of felt but I didn't know why I felt it. It's very difficult to explain yeah. <laughs> um, because yeah. Uh, from that moment on, when my parents told me what AJ felt about me, I didn't actually make any contact with AJ for a number of months. Um, and I just sat with this thing and I kept going, oh, it's not a big deal, whatever. Some guy thinks that you're soulmates. Mm -hmm. You know, I, other people had said to me before in spiritual circles, like, oh, wow, you have an amazing energy or, you know, oh, wow. you." And I just was like, oh, whatever, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I felt like the guys were a bit sleazy, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, and this guy wasn't sleazy. He wasn't pursuing me. He hadn't told me anything. And I didn't really, I could, you know, there, I couldn't see any reason why I was giving this so much time. Yeah and thought inside of myself. Because I was staying at my parents' house and I was between jobs, I just found myself sitting in their garden, just in this process that wasn't even really thinking. It was just sort of feeling strange. Feeling, <laughs> but it was a feeling of like, hey, pay attention. Pay attention. You know about this. And then my mind would kick in and go, no, I don't. What are you doing? You know, it was this very strange thing that was happening to me. And I knew after, after some weeks that I wasn't going to be able to let this go. Like I, and I kind of have that nature where I think if there's something that I need to find out, I'm going to, find, I'm going to investigate it and resolve it. Because I have this sort of, I don't know if it's a need to know, but it's a need to resolve things. You know, can't leave them hanging or just, just you know, push it to one side. <clears throat> Once I'm peaked on something, I've got to sort it out. <laughs> and so, and so, I've been going through this process where I was, I was, just, it was such a strange thing that I couldn't even really, I wasn't really distressed at that point. I just had, I just felt like I needed to give attention to this thing and then I kept going, what is the thing you need to give attention to? And it, it just kind of got circular until this point where I said, right, I'm contacting this guy. 
and I'm just asking him, what is this all about? And, and so began our email exchange. And that's how we started to get to know each other via email. Sometime after that, I joined AJ on an overseas trip and I began to just talk to get to know him uh, still. And during that time, I started to experience memories. Now that sounds like I'd never had any before, but it's not true. What I, what I came to understand when I was having, because now I had a framework for what was actually going on, I was having these emotional experiences and because there was now an allowance of a new mm. possibility inside of me, I understood it more. And once that started to happen, I understood that this has been happening all my life. I just didn't understand what it all meant that I'd had intense emotional experiences that seemed to be attached to things that hadn't happened before. But I shut them down really rapidly because I, I thought, well, that's not true or that doesn't exist. There was no context for me to put that emotion into. And I didn't have any sense that feeling emotions would, ha would help them leave you yeah. and understand that. And so I thought, well, I'm having a, an atten intense sadness that doesn't seem to belong anywhere. And I don't really like that experience, so I'm going to shut it down. So that had happened at various times throughout my life before I met AJ. Now meeting him, I began to just entertain the idea that this was memories. And that just brought a lot of things into clarity for me. And so then I began to have a real sense, well, I know who I am because I remember who I am. And it was more than that probably, hello, it was also a feeling of, the best way I can describe it is like coming home to a sense that I'd had in childhood but I, I'd suppressed. So you kind of, just to re, so you kind of knew who you were as a child in a sense that you'd had some glimpses or feelings of who you really were as a kid that yeah. shut everything down as you got yeah. older and then get to this point and go, oh wow, I kind of remember her. Yes. Kind of thing. Yeah, 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 a lot like that. Um, and Sorry. yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's, that's really exactly what it was like. And it was sort of felt like a homecoming in, in it. But then I still had all these other like, oh my gosh, what's the world going to think about all of this, which would then throw me into, I don't want the homecoming. I actually want to deny it again. And I, yeah. I cycled through this for, for years, really. But, I, but in answer to the question, which is really how I know who I am, it's about... It's about the memories that I, that I have, but also the sense of knowledge of, that I've always known that I'm someone other than just Mary Luck or that I'm other than Mary, that I have awarenesses and knowledge that didn't, didn't come from this experience. Uh, and, you know, it's even confronting for me to say that out loud because it feel, I feel like, oh, wow, I'm still working through that thing of how everyone's going to perceive that, but that's the truth. Yeah. And, and probably the other thing I would like to say about that and being Mary Magdalene and knowing that I'm Mary Magdalene, through all of this, I've never had a strong attachment to the way that the world perceives Mary Magdalene it, um, that, in that I don't feel like I'm feeling the role or the identity that the world perceives Mary Magdalene to be, I feel like I have an experience and a life and the name that I had was Mary Magdalene. Right. I don't know how I can explain that better. Well, whereas everyone's kind of, everyone's got this idea of who Mary Magdalene is. So they've yeah. created Mary Magdalene. Yes. And y That's y not me. That's not you. And I don't feel like I'm <clears throat> coming to claim who they have think created. that is. That person's not real. Yeah. I'm real and I'm Mary Magdalene, but I'm not... It, I don't feel like um, I have special importance. It's just who I am. I don't feel like, um, yeah, that I'm somehow more significant or have more that special about me because of this is who I am. Like, I just have a memory of being a kid and growing up and stuff happening and getting married and having kids of my own and passing into the spirit world and, you know, being with my soulmate and doing, 
doing things we love, teaching divine truth and um, sharing a life together. And now we're still doing that. And we very much want to talk to the world about divine truth and to help people to grow in love and towards God. But I don't have a sense that um, I'm here to stake a claim on everyone else's. I don't want glory. I don't want... And I don't really relate to um, the way the world sees Jesus and Mary Magdalene because that's not who we are. That's not how we have lived. And so I don't have a sense that I'm that I'm here to, I don't know, steal some thunder or glory or something like that, which I think a lot of people believe about us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Knowing you, I don't think you're much like the stories <laughs> I've heard of Mary Magdalene, <laughs> personally. Yeah. <laughs> and the same with Jesus, actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but did we answer the question well? That's important. Um, um, how I know. Yeah. So I know because of my memories. I also know because I have this deep sense of knowing not that I'm Mary Magdalene as the world depicts it, yes. but, but that, I, <clears throat> that I have lived this life in the spirit world and I have had this relationship with God that's enabled me to come back here. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, on another topic, I'd really like to, like the, sen the senses that you have, I'd be pretty interested in talking to you about as well. Yeah, sure. It's pretty difficult to describe. Yeah, that's yeah. what I feel. <laughs> so, so <laughs> just, we'll just put it out there. Cool. Um, I think, right. Yeah, I think you answered it pretty well. Probably the the final thing I would say about that is that also I don't have some sense of martyrdom about it or that I have to take up this role. Like I don't feel I have to take up the role in any role. <laughs> I just have to be myself. And I don't feel like, oh, this is a hardship I'm going to have to endure. Yeah. Although sometimes I'm felt through or am feeling through certain emotions, I don't feel like I'm doing the world a big favour or that, um, you know, that it's... I don't feel like I have an investment in this being true yeah. in any sense. But I've really searched for... <laughs> I've, I've really done my homework on trying to figure out how this can't be true. <laughs> my biggest fear has always been that, oh, I'm really going to have to give up this struggle within myself and just accept that this is me. And I feel uh, that's where I've come to more recently. I've always be known that it's me. I've mm. always, but I've fought it tooth and nail. And I've tried to look for other reasons for the experience and the senses and the, the feeling that I have because it's felt pretty scary and confronting. When you're asked about your identity, you often seem to be very uncomfortable answering the questions about it. From an outsider's perspective, it seems that you do not really believe you are Mary Magdalene. Why are you so uncomfortable if you know you are Mary Magdalene? Yes, it's true. For a long time, I've appeared very uncomfortable, especially at seminars and in public talking about who I am. And the, the simplest answer to that question is that I've just been very afraid of how others will perceive me. Which is sad, really, because in the end I've given them a perception of myself that isn't very honest. Mm. I've been suppressing who I am because I want to avoid judgment or criticism. Probably to, to give context maybe to what's been going on inside of me, <laughs> is that I'm aware that us saying that we're Jesus and Mary Magdalene is very confronting for a lot of people. A lot of Christians have a lot of investment in Jesus being celibate mm. uh, and we still receive emails and things from people just not only abusing us for making these claims but saying that you know Jesus would never touch someone like me or these kinds of things or would never touch a woman basically. So I've, I've been fully aware that many religious people would find me speaking about who I am to be quite confronting to their own beliefs and that they might get really angry. Mm. And some of them have done. Not all of them. Some of them have done. Uh, so that's been one reason why I've just wanted to, to shut down about the whole thing. I'm also aware that a lot of people in uh, other spiritual circles have quite an investment in Mary Magdalene being a certain way, being um, 
quite confident and uh, all-knowing and very attractive and um, here, to, here to help people and be the divine feminine and, and all of these kinds of things. And for me, that's been really scary because I don't feel any of those things. And so I've felt really exposed in public. I've felt like, wow, <laughs> I'm not really that impressive. <laughs> and, and here I am saying who I am and... I've wanted to just sort of hide behind the nearest piece of furniture most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes you can see me in talks almost behind the whiteboard <laughs> because I haven't really, I haven't felt confident about uh, who I am and I've also felt that people might attack me from other, not just Christians, but other people might attack me for not being impressive enough. Yeah. Also... I feel that a lot of non-spiritual or people without spiritual beliefs basically have the feeling that um, I've, I've lost it, I like that I have some kind of psychiatric illness or that I'm somehow controlled by this cult leader who's saying he's <coughs> Jesus and, and I, that's really not very nice feeling either to have people um, present you with. And my, my family, my immediate family, since I met AJ, have basically said that they can't accept our life, who we are, or even just agree to disagree about um, our beliefs. And they've rejected us. They've been really nasty to me and AJ, like they've called us names, they've abused us, they've told me I'm throwing my life away, they've told me that, you know, that basically I've lost it and I've gone crazy. So that all happened before I even attended a public seminar with AJ. So for me, if my own family was gonna do that, how was the world gonna respond? And that made me really not very confident in public talking about these things. My fear was such that I just, that's what was dominating the way I was communicating. I just felt, oh, how's everyone gonna cope with this? How's everyone gonna cope with this? And I just, I just would clam up and get really shaky and look flaky, basically. Like, I feel like, to be very honest, I'm aware that I've looked really uncertain, unsure, flaky. Often I've been really almost passive or passive aggressive with AJ while he's talking about who he is because it's scaring me so much. And I'm aware that all of that is, people can see that. <laughs> um, even if they don't know exactly what's going on, they can see that there's something not right and it makes it appear like I'm not very certain. Mm. And in a way, I was invested in that really because it helped me avoid other people feeling other things towards me like that I, that I was claiming glory or I was claiming to be special or that I did think I was all that or that um, I did want to ruffle their feathers or I did want to confront them. And, and none of those things are true, but... I didn't want anyone to even consider that that might be true about me or to feel that towards me. I also know that historically there's been men on earth who've claimed to be Jesus, who aren't Jesus, who have done really horrible things to other people. And, and so I was aware that by us saying who we are, people would naturally start to be suspicious. Or maybe it's not naturally, but commonly, <laughs> yeah. they would be suspicious. Many people base their um, reactions to new things on what's happened in the past with old things. So us saying that we're Jesus and Mary Magdalene, to me, meant that most people would view what had happened in the past and project that onto us. And that does happen quite a bit. And I just, I simply wasn't humble enough to experience that just stay true to myself and let other people have their own experience and their own opinions. I feel more in that place now, you know, I feel it's okay for people to believe what they want to believe about us. It doesn't make it true and actually I'm more able to experience any grief or fear that I have about what they might say or want to do to us as a result of it. I wouldn't say that I'm completely comfortable still talking about who I am in every situation. I still have fears come up and I still sometimes don't feel like I want to share with someone if they're not um, really believing me mm. or even open to the idea. But I'm challenging that more now and I feel like 
at least I've come to a sense of some peace inside of myself, of desiring to be myself, no matter how others feel about that. There's still work to go. <laughs> as mm. many people will see, even the way I speak in seminars, often I'm not as confident as I perhaps feel about the topic because I'm, I'm still concerned about how I'm being viewed by others. And I still sometimes want to rely on AJ because he's dealt with a lot of these issues. He's very confident and he's, he's okay to receive projections or emotions from people that are not perhaps kind or comfortable and still continue to be himself. Uh, for me, that's, I'm a work in progress still on that issue. And in addressing your question, in the past, I was really not coping with it in terms of I was not being willing to just let other people have their experience and me have mine and still be confidently myself. And so I would be flaky and in indirect, um, unspecific, all these things that make people think, oh, gee, she really doesn't know what's going on there. And, you know, a lot of people said, oh, it's all, it's all AJ feeding her things. And that's very much not the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was very strict with AJ, if you like, <laughs> when we first met and told him that I didn't want him to talk to me about any of his memories, that I wasn't going to necessarily believe anything that he believed, that I had to have my own experience and I was actually quite controlling of him in a way. But he respected that very much and he has never, he's never made it a condition of our relationship even that I share his beliefs about things. Um, but I certainly, I mean, I, I do share his beliefs about just about everything. <laughs> yeah. What are your memories like and how do you experience them? Well, my memories are varied and diverse. I've had, a, and by this question we're really meaning my first memories century. of my first century life and yeah. life in the spirit world, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. So... I experience those memories in a slightly different way than I experience memories of things that have happened in the last 34 years, nearly 35 years, um, that I've been back here on Earth. So when I have memories from the first century or in the spirit world, I have all of the emotions associated with that memory and I understand the event and the people involved in the event and what was happening for me during the event or events. But I don't have a visual um, depiction. I don't have a scene in my head and I can't recall visual things about it or smells or tastes. But it is just as real as if I'm having a memory of something that's happened to me in the last 34 years. And in those memories, I often have a smell or a taste or a scene or a, a colour or something that... I associate or that that I remember from that that event happening as well as the emotions of what was going on during that time the, the basis of all of our memories is actually emotional yeah I'm kind of sort of one of you hoping but just can I kind of do a clarify now sure I'm gonna oh, okay some more I'll carry on, on. yeah and at the end. Um, so most of our well, the basis of all of our memories and how we remember things is actually through our emotions. And that's why for a lot of us, we don't have clear memories of our childhood because we've suppressed the emotions in our childhood. And when we open up emotionally, suddenly we seem to have all these new memories or they're memories of things that happened in our childhood that before then we couldn't remember well. Yeah. So my first century memories and memories of things that happened in the spirit world and the memories of things that have happened to me here on Earth in the last 34 years, they're, they're, their basis is all emotional. But there is this distinction that I was telling you about, and that is that the ones that I had in the spirit world and on Earth in the first century, I had a different physical body when I was on Earth, and, it, and physical and spirit body, and the spirit body when I went into the spirit world, than I have now. So the, the memories were stored in my soul. But, and here back on earth, the memories are still stored in my soul. But I have other, um, other ways of, uh, other tools, if you like, of, mem of remembering. And that is my spirit body senses and mind and the brain in, in this body. And so that's why I can have visual and sensory memories 
because the 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 vision and the set, all of the senses are stored in our in our spirit body's mind and and body. So those memories of the last thirty four years, I have I have these other sensory um, memories, if you like, along with the emotions. And for the time in the spirit world and on earth before then, I just have the emotions because I have a different spirit body and physical body. So maybe I can expand even further. Yeah, yeah. it's just the, the obviously I've got no understanding of <laughs> the reincarnation process. And yep. so I'm not, and I don't know if I'm going to even understand when you explain, to be yeah, honest. Sure. But um, it's like I can identify with the memories of what you talk about in your last 30 things, but they're sort of the soul memory. That's, yeah. well, I'm kind of fascinated and at the same time not, um, yeah, finding it hard to have anything to tangible yeah. yep. to connect with like, okay, well, I, and I suppose they can't because there's nothing like it really, is there? Well, let me give, let's have a tangible example. Okay, that'd be great. Of being hit by a bus. Okay. <laughs> It's like pretty extreme. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, and I've given this example to mm. people before because it's it kind of, I hope it sort of demonstrates a little bit more <clears> what <throat> I'm talking about. So, if, if I'd been hit by a bus in the last 34 years, yep. I would have the memory of, if I was fully allowing all of my emotions, I would have, when I recalled that event, I would be able to remember standing on the curb whether it was sunny, if I could feel the sun or the wind, I'd, I'd remember those sensory things. And, and I might remember things that were going on in my head. I might have been distracted or upset about something. I'd remember stepping out onto the road. And then I might remember the screech of brakes, so I'd hear that. I remember the, the sound of that. Uh, the feeling of impact on my physical body of something really large hitting me <laughs> unexpectedly. Yeah. The shock, yeah. so the yeah. emotion, the shock associated with that, the physical pain associated with that, the feeling of helplessness maybe, and, and everything that happened from then on. I would have sights, sounds, smells. Yeah. I might smell the asphalt as I hit it, um, the blood maybe, of people coming over, the sound of mobile phones. I might hear all have all kinds of different memories yeah. that are associated yeah. with this bus accident. Yeah. Now, say I'd been hit by a bus, even though there weren't buses yeah. in the first century. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I was now here, back on Earth, remembering that event, I would have the sense that I was on a curb. I wouldn't have any visual for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, necessarily, I wouldn't have a scene in my head of what that curb looked like or this, how the air felt or any of those things. But I would know I was on the, on the curb and that I was feeling distracted and upset about something. So I would I had have the emotional sense of where I was and what I was feeling. And then as I stepped off the curb, I wouldn't necessarily have any of the sounds. Yeah. Of, you know, I wouldn't have the sounds of the bus screeching, but I would feel the fear and the shock. Okay. Suddenly what's happened, I would know that a bus has hit me because Even though I can't see it or hear it, but the feelings, I have the knowledge that it's happened. And then I would feel the pain still and the grief and the powerlessness and the sense that people are coming to help me and all of these things, but I don't have a visual. I don't have the smell. I don't have the sounds. Mm. I just, but it's as real as if, you did. As, as if it happened in this last 34 years. Yeah. It's, in fact, it's incredibly intense. There, because the only way to exp access these memories is to be open emotionally, then the emotions are overwhelming. Yeah. And it's, it's a very intense sense of something that has happened and how I felt throughout it. Um, and you can feel, obviously, the other people as well because you know yes. what those people felt like. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And wow. so that's the main... or oh, It's one of the ways that I know who my soulmate is as well because I remember experiences with him. Yeah. From a soul, like an emotional perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The knowledge that he was there and the knowledge of things that have happened. Obviously, I didn't get hit by a bus in the first century. <laughs> and most of the things that did happen in my first century life have not happened to me in the last 34 years. Okay. Which 
in itself is quite um, validating in that I know I'm not confusing something that's happened in the last 34 years with, with another experience. But at the same time, it's very disconcerting when you start allowing this because you feel like, wow, this thing really happened, I know, but it didn't happen in the last 34 years. And this is where often this psychological, the mind wants to dominate mm. and say, that can't be real. And the soul is screaming, well, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real journey, hey, to, to actually just accept your soul rather yeah. than your mind and believe that. Definitely. Believe For all of us. Yeah. Um, but especially in the case of the 14 of us who have returned to Earth, because there is this added psychological element to it where your memories, you know, like this is Eloise's life and your mind is not going to protest at that because your no. mind's been with your soul that whole time. Yeah. For me, this mind has not been with this soul this whole time. So the mind, which is very much lauded on the planet at the moment, that we should listen Actually. to the mind, um, is trying to dominate the soul all the time and say, that can't be real, that can't be real. But the soul knows it is. Yeah. And, and the soul is much more powerful than the mind. And that's why it's exhausting to try and <laughs> dominate your experience and your emotions with your mind because the soul is much more... Uh, it's, it's the controller of everything, really, in our experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating. Hmm. Pretty amazing. Have you considered that you believe you're Mary Magdalene because of spirit influence? You claim that you are Mary Magdalene. Is it possible that you are channeling another spirit who claims she is Mary Magdalene? And are you attributing that connection to your identity? Okay. This is a common question that I've received over the years. And the answer is yes. I have considered that maybe a spirit is influencing me into believing that I'm someone that I'm not. Um, maybe that uh, the experiences that I was having somehow could be attributed to a spirit. I've certainly considered that. I've resolved that it's not true for a number of reasons. The first is probably that I am a spirit medium yeah. and I can differentiate between the, the emotions of a spirit and my own emotions. And as we've discussed in previous questions, yeah. a lot of my knowledge of who I am comes from the experience of my emotions the allowance of my emotions and my memories associated with them. So I've had these experiences that are emotional. I also have this deep sense that I am Mary Magdalene. So I've considered, could a spirit be giving me these emotions or this sense in some way? So the first thing was that I, that I have come to have a very strong sense of when I'm feeling my own emotions and when I'm feeling a spirit's emotions. And to, just for the benefit of the audience, it is very common for spirits to influence people on earth, yeah. especially in certain situations when we don't want to feel a feeling of fear or sadness. Sometimes a spirit can come and influence us for a matter of minutes into a state of rage or shut down or something. So that does happen and that has happened to me. And I do understand the difference between what it's like to have the feeling of the influence of a spirit and the a spirit's emotions and my own experience. Yeah. So that's probably the first, the first part of the answer, if you like. I've also looked at things from a more, if you like, a more pragmatic or logical perspective because I've thought, well, you know, maybe I'm not such a foolproof... Um, uh, I've had to come to a sense of surety about these things inside of myself through experience, but, you know, maybe that's not really satisfactory enough. Because, well, as I've said earlier, I was really shopping for reasons yeah. why maybe I wasn't Mary Magdalene. It's really double proof. <laughs> yes, double proof. So I looked at the idea that, well, if a spirit did come and overcloak me, then people would have observed a very rapid change in my persona. I would have been like Mary Luck one day and then suddenly completely different and full of surety about who I am. This is yeah. what we see with other people who become overcloaked and believe that they're someone else. There's, there's often a rapid and immediate and dramatic change in their personality in the way that they behave and the things that they say and that they do. And for me, we haven't seen that. 
uh, that hasn't happened. It's only been through me developing more and more humility that I think that people are able to observe now some growth in me and some changes in my demeanour that are actually the result of me growing in humility and some truth and some love. And so there's a gradual process occurring before people's eyes and not an immediate one. And there's also been this aspect of me trying to rationalise my way out of what I already <laughs> believe to be true, which is not very common for people who are overcloaked. Yeah. Usually they gain surety and that's it. And they sort of remain this static person while that spirit is with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing probably within that also is that if I was just mm. having a lot of emotional experiences that were not my own but from a spirit, then because of the way the soul is constructed, that wouldn't help the spirit to grow and it wouldn't right. help me to grow. Yeah. Uh, because each person has to experience and release emotions from themselves, for themselves, for them to be free of them and to grow. If I was in some kind of a relationship with a spirit um, and they were giving me emotions or experiences, then um, I wouldn't be resolving things and I am resolving things. We are seeing a growth in me, it be it sometimes quite gradual and slow. <laughs> there are changes happening. And I also feel more connected to myself and more connected to God when I experience myself and my emotions. And that wouldn't be able to occur if it was a spirit with me. Yeah. And I suppose maybe to expand on this even further, if I was being influenced by a spirit who was in a low condition of love in the spirit world and they wanted some attention or glory or power or they wanted to avoid themselves in some way by influencing me here on earth to say and believe that I'm Mary Magdalene. Then because of the way the different laws of God operate upon my soul and that spirit's soul, you would actually be seeing a degradation in my condition and their condition. And so if they were influencing me and degrading in condition, you would actually be seeing someone who was becoming more nasty, more narcissistic, yeah. more selfish, more unhappy. And I actually think we're seeing the, the reverse. I can vouch that we're seeing the reverse. <laughs> um, and probably the last possibility is if I was being, if I wasn't Mary Magdalene and I was being influenced by a spirit who is Mary Magdalene, for if that's a hypothetical idea, then, and that Mary Magdalene is in a high condition of love yeah. and they came along and influenced me perhaps to do some good or something in the world, as soon as they saw that I was saying that I was Mary Magdalene and I wasn't, then they would cease their influence of me. So I feel very confident mm. <laughs> that, that that exhausts all the possibilities for how a spirit could be influencing me and it also shows that it can't really be the case. There's also the aspect that when I'm allowing myself and allowing my memories, I feel in connection with God. When I suppress those things, I don't feel in connection with God. And when I allow them, I do. And for me, that's probably the biggest proof that a spirit is not involved in this experience for me. Because God wouldn't enter into an yeah. experience where a spirit is influencing someone to believe something that's not true. Because the way we connect with God is through truth, really, through an acceptance or an allowance of truth in that moment. And so me having this experience and experiencing more and more of God, the more and more I allow, tells me definitively that it's not a spirit-influenced experience. Yeah, cool. Okay. <laughs>